Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, the men's road season concludes with four more one-day races in Italy and France. The British National Championships takes place for the first time in two and a half years. The cyclocross season is in full swing with rounds two and three of the World Cup. And the ZRL, the Zwift Racing League Premier Tier, has started too. We've also got news of the Tour de France routes for next year. And despite it being mid-October, a bumper edition of Transfer News. We'll start with a quick wrap-up of the final road races of the season. At the Coppa Agnostini, Movistar spent most of the finale setting things up for an attack by Alejandro Valverde that never came. He followed a move over the final climb of the day, and from that group of seven, the winning move was made. Matteo Trentin and Alexei Lutsenko were the ones to make it, but a lapse of concentration from Trentin in the closing 200 metres saw the Kazakh get the jump on him to take what, in the end, was a very comfortable victory. And that was a much-needed win for the Astana Premier Tech team, who, if you take away national championships, have only won five pro races this season. As in next year, they'll be known as Astana Kazakhstan with all the cues. At the Giro del Veneto, it was a similar scenario. A group of the strongest riders in the race had prized themselves clear on the final climb, but after a coming together of the front few groups, Matteo Trentin once again found himself clear in a small group containing Zandro Maurice and Jonathan Restrepo. On this occasion, Trentin wasn't caught napping, but he just didn't have the power and speed to match Maurice, who took Alpecin Fenix's 33rd win on the last day of their road racing season. Now, that day also marked the last race for Petr Bakoc. The Czech rider had a nasty training crash in South Africa a few years ago, and whilst he never quite managed to get back to his previous form, he did well enough to earn himself a place at this year's Tour de France, where he rode in support of the team's captains. We wish him all the best for the future. And finally, at the brand new Veneto Classic, it was a first professional victory from Samuele Battistella, the 21-year-old Italian solo to victory at the first edition of the race, which featured a cobbled climb that wouldn't have seemed out of place at the Tour of Flanders. UAE team Emirates Matteo Trentin had been with Battistella, but crashed out of what turned out to be the winning move. It meant the team would have to settle for second place with Mark Hershey, which marked one of his best results of the season, with Jonathan Restrepo continuing his run of form in third. The race was actually part of a trio of events organised by Pipo Pizzato. Remember him? Yes, of course. That also included a gravel race specifically for pro riders. Only male pro riders for the time being, with 34 of them tackling the 132km Serenissima gravel race. 110 of it was on gravel roads. It was the first time Alexei Litsenko had ever ridden a gravel bike, but it didn't seem to hold him back. He cruised to victory with over half a minute in hand over Ricardo Minali and Nathan Haas, who is rumoured to be turning his attention full-time to gravel in the coming years. At the British National Championships, Ethan Hayter rounded off a stellar season by taking the elite time trial crown for the first time, beating Dan Bigham and James Shaw, both of Ribble Well Tight, and then going on to win the Criterion Championships the next day. It meant he had the possibility to make history by taking the triple crown of national championships on the famous Lincoln course. However, despite looking to be the strongest rider in the race, he would have to settle for bronze. Two riders came to the foot of the Michael Gate climb with a chance of becoming national champion, and there was nothing to separate Ben Swift from Fred Wright most of the way up. Swift just had the edge as they neared the top, though, holding off Wright to the line to ensure he gets to wear the British national colours for another few months. Wright's consolation was winning the under-23 title. Ethan's younger brother, Leo, dominated the under-23 men's time trial event, and Anna Shackley took the women's under-23, Anna Henderson beating Joss Loudon to the women's elite TT title. In the road race, it was pie for Georgie, who proved to be strongest. Drops the coal, rode a fantastic race under some pretty dreadful conditions, constantly attacking off the front with the four riders they'd managed to get in the front group. In the end, though, they weren't able to outfox or outride Georgie, who claimed the title. A brilliant ride as well by 19-year-old Josie Nelson saw her take silver with world hour record holder Joss Loudon in third. In other races, Stander Wolf took his first pro victory in his last race of the season, the Boucle de Lone at Châteaulin, soloing to win over half a minute ahead of Valentin Madois, whilst Arna Marit also took a first pro victory the previous day at Le Classique Moribond. The 22-year-old Belgian outsprinted Brian Cockard and Elia Viviani. 
What's coming up on GCM Plus then? Well, things are finally starting to quieten down on the road front a little bit, but we do still have one final roll of the dice for the Women's World Tour with the Ronda van Drenthe ending their season this coming Saturday. That's the 23rd of October. Beyond that, our focus turns to the boards and the dirt of track and cyclocross respectively. I mean, technically cyclocross has boards too, you just gotta jump over them as opposed to ride around them. But anyway, I'm digressing. Uh, the World Track Championships takes place in the Roubaix Velodrome this year, indoor one rather than the outdoor one that welcomes the finishes of Paris-Roubaix. It starts on Wednesday and runs through to Sunday. We also have the second round of the Zwift Racing League, or ZRL, live for you this evening. I will be hosting with Hannah Walker back to provide her expert insights. Round one started with a bang, as hopefully you saw last Monday. Racing for the first time around the Makuri Islands, the predominantly flat course proved far more selective than we imagined. In the men's race, Canyon Esports started strongly, using the intermediate sprints to build up a buffer, but it was the next Esports, powered by Insured, who won the day, helped in no small part by a fantastic sprint finish from Premier Division rookie James Barnes. In the women's, it was the Aeonian race team who dominated, winning by an almighty 193 points to the 110 points of defending champions Heino. In no small part, that was down to the formidable strength of Lois Adegeist, who took the individual win as well. We've also got four more cyclocross races for you this week with the final two rounds of the US Cyclocross Series on Saturday and Sunday evening. That's European time, of course. The next round of the Super Prestige in Rudevorda on Saturday afternoon. And on Sunday, the Cyclocross World Cup moves back to Europe with a bang. The iconic Zonovan Sandpit beckons on Sunday afternoon. Do not miss it. Uh, we've also secured the rights that will allow us to show the UCI World Cyclocross Championships in the USA, which I'm sure will come as welcome news to all our subscribers over there. The elite races will take place on the 29th and 30th of January next year in Fayetteville in the USA. And it was that venue actually that played host to the second round of the UCI Cyclocross World Cup last Wednesday, giving riders in attendance the chance to check out the course. By all accounts, I think they liked it, even if it was a mud fest after the heavens opened soon before the start. Marianne Voss and Lucinda Brand, who'd done battle through to the finish of round one, were back at it again in Fayetteville. However, on this occasion, Voss faded towards the end, whilst Brand went from strength to strength to take a fine solo victory for the Balois Trek Lions. In the men's race, it was once again an all-Belgian podium, but the rider on the top step had never won a World Cup before. Quinton Hermans was on fire though, leaving everyone else in his wake from just before the midway point of the race. Clearly a season on the road, including competing in the Giro d'Italia, has taken him up another level. In finishing second, Eli Isabit consolidated his lead in the series though, with his teammate Michael Van Tornout managing to get third despite a mechanical later in the race. The third and final round in the US was in Iowa City last night and it finished a successful US campaign for both Isabit and Voss, who've come away with two wins from three each. On the Mount Crumpet climb, Voss went quickest on the eighth and final lap, allowing her to finally distance Denise Betzema, who took her third podium from the three races. Hungarian super talent Kata Vass took third ahead of world champion Lucinda Brand. Voss now leads the World Cup standings, but will take a well-earned break before building up to the second half of the cyclocross season. In the men's, with Quinten Hermans only able to take fifth on the day, it's Isabit who goes back into the lead of the World Cup. Hermans had been looking strong in the opening stages, but got it wrong on one of the barrier jumps, which was at the end of his time in the lead group. Behind Isabit, a hard chase by Lars van der Haar saw him get close to the Belgian in the closing stages, but not quite close enough. He'd end up second with Michael van Tornout in third. In other news, the Tour de France route was presented last Thursday, and for the first time, ASO revealed not one, but two routes. Yes, we are going to have an entire month of top quality racing next July, with the three-week men's race immediately followed by an eight-day Tour de France femme avec Zwift. Highlights of the men's include a Grand Depart in Copenhagen, which starts with a 13K time trial, a return to Cobblestones on stage five, a return to Alpe d'Huez for the first time in four years as well. The women's race starts on the Champs-Élysées on the same day that the men's race finishes, and their route features gravel roads, or Chemin Blanc, on stage five. The GC, though, is likely to be decided on the seventh and eighth stages, with the grand finale being La Planche de Belfi, with its 24% gradients on gravel, leading to the final finish line of the race. Now, if you'd like full details of both routes, make sure you check out the video that Dan did last week. 
Now, one of the teams that are likely to be on the start of the Tour de France fam are the UAE Team Emirates. Yep, they have said that they will have a women's team next year, but they won't be starting afresh, having taken over the license from Ale BTC Ljubljana. Details of the rider roster have yet to be released, but you can imagine that there will be some transfers there. Been plenty of others this week, and perhaps the biggest and most surprising news was that Jakob Fuglsang is leaving Astana. We hadn't heard any rumours about this at all before the statement was released last week. He'll be headed to the Israel startup nation along with Ugo Uhl, a quality pairing, but neither will do much to lower the already high average age of that team. Another rider leaving Astana for passes new is Luis Leon Sanchez. After seven years with the Kazakh squad, the Spaniard will be heading to Bahrain victorious. And the same team have also acquired the signature of Johan Price Peterson, a time trial specialist who has twice won the European under 23 time trial champs and who recently added the under 23 world title to those achievements too. Astana though have finally confirmed the return of Miguel Angel Lopez to the team. The Colombian fell out with Overstart at the Vuelta, later having his contracts terminated. He'll head back to the team where he spent the first six years of his career. Moving on from Bahrain are Wout Pools, Eros Kapeki and Scott Davies, none of whom have confirmed their plans for next year yet. Marco Halla is also on the move and has been confirmed that he'll be joining Bora Hansgrohe next year. Two of their most successful riders from this season have been given contract extensions, Gino Maida and Damiano Caruso. Georg Steinhauser will join EF Education Nippo in 2022 as a Neo Pro, and not only will he be racing top-level pro events, the 19-year-old will also continue his studies in 2022. American Sean Quinn also makes the move to the team, having spent the last three years with the Hagen's Berman Action Team. Also joining the team is double Tour de Lavenir stage winner Marin van der Berg. The 22-year-old Dutchman makes the step from the Groupama FDJ development squad. And finally, three riders are moving away from the Ineos Grenadiers to new teams next year. Sebastian Henau and Leonardo Basso both move to Astana, whilst Ivan Sosa heads to Team Movistar. Right then, that is all for this week. Dan will be back to take you through all of the latest racing news this time next week. But I hope to see you lot later this evening for that Zwift Racing League. Bye for now.